Amen. Now, on Wednesday night, we don't have the white receptacle boxes, so if you do have an offering to put in tonight, there's, there's a drop box in the lobby between those two doors, okay? But they have to purify those things for every Sunday, and so, uh, so they're taking care of that, so that's why they're not back there tonight. And let me encourage you, if you're watching online now, I know we want you to be safe, and we want you to know you can come to the worship services on Sunday at 9 and 11 and be totally safe and do distancing like we're supposed to. Uh, if you come on Sunday, the row in front of you and the row behind you will be unoccupied. And then we have three seats in between you and the next person. Of course, a family group can sit together. And we, we are very, very careful. And we don't want anyone to get sick. But don't let the enemy put fear in your heart. One of the lies of the enemy, I've learned in 60 years of ministry, once you get out of the habit of church attendance, the enemy will do everything he can to prevent you from going back again. He doesn't like it when the people of God get together and the Spirit of God is moving and people come in and need the Lord and get set free and get delivered. And so don't let the enemy cheat you out of the blessing of God. Again, the book of Hebrews gives us a warning. It says, stop forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is and that much more as you see the day approaching. Now, if you don't feel comfortable, of course, stay home and watch, but don't let the enemy put fear into your heart, okay? And we don't want you to come if you're afraid. We don't want you to do that. I'm not trying to put pressure on it. I'm just trying to remind you I know how the enemy works, the church attendance, because again, I've been at it for over 60 years. And he will do everything he can to keep you from coming back. But we have service at 9 and 11. And the rows that are empty for the early service are the ones we use for the second service. So the ones that are occupied in the first service will be empty. And so, so you'll be perfectly safe and everything is clean. And you can wear your mask in and you can wear your mask on the way out. And, you, and we have plenty of things to cleanse your hands and all kinds of stuff if you want them. So don't let the enemy cheat you out of coming together if you feel you want to come. And again, 9 o'clock and 11, we will be here. And I want to remind, remind you, on Wednesday night, we are having the youth service now, too, on Wednesday nights. And so uh, they're in the gym across the street while the adults are in, in, are in here and with the children. We don't have children's service because you can't keep them apart. <laughs> and, and they mix. <laughs> and so we, we don't have the children's services yet. And we're just waiting to see what's ahead. But God's in control. He, Oh, this didn't take him by surprise. He's not wringing his hands and getting all nervous about it or frustrated. As a matter of fact, I did something tonight I'd never done before. I looked in the mirror and saw me with a mask on. <laughs> God, who's, who's that grotesque-looking creature there? And uh, I didn't recognize me. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it's a time we live in, but God's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he, he, he's really faithful. And we do appreciate your faithfulness in giving. I learned many years ago as a young Christian that you can't outgive God. It's just absolutely impossible. I, I know you've all heard the story about the raise I got when I started, uh, I started being faithful with tithing. But there was another time uh, when our friend Ernie Jones was going to the mission field for the first time. And he was going to India as a missionary. And we were attending East Side Assembly of God in Springfield, Missouri. And they were trying to raise part of his budget that night. And the Lord spoke to me and said, make a pledge. Well, we weren't making much money at all. We were, uh, the GI Bill, I think, paid me $127 a month at that time. And my wife was working at the Gospel Publishing House in the missions department. And, and she wasn't making much money uh, uh, when she was working there. But, and God said to make a pledge. And I turned over to tell Jean, and she was way ahead of me. She had the same amount and everything way before I ever thought of it. And then the Lord said, stand up and do it publicly. And I said, but God, your word says, don't let their left hand know what your right hand is doing. And he said, they're not your left hand. Get up. So I got up and made the pledge publicly. And because everybody knew we were students, I mean, other people started doing the same thing. And his whole missionary budget was met in one night just because of a step of faith. Now, again, we, uh, we knew we were going to pay our pledge because sometimes we lived on popcorn and we thought we could do that again, too. We'd done that sometimes in college. And we lived on popcorn for three weeks one time. And uh, it didn't hurt us at all. <laughs> it didn't hurt us at all. We've made, and so, so uh, we get to my home church in Detroit. That summer we were going to stay with my mother in, in Detroit and her mother in Akron, Ohio. And we were going to spend our summer up there and then go back to college again in Springfield. 
And I went to my home church in Detroit, and Brother Burnham, that was in his 80s, walked up and said, you come and take me grocery shopping tomorrow. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So he went and took Brother Burnham grocery shopping, and we get back to his house. And he said, George, he said, you know, my wife's gone home to be with the Lord, and I don't have any children. And he said, I get three retirement checks. And the Lord told me, as long as you're in college, you are to get my Ford Motor Company retirement check. I got that check. I, I actually received that check to finish my bachelor's and my first master's degree. And then God took Brother Burnham home. You can't outgive God. He may not give it back next Tuesday, but the main thing that I like is Luke 16 says he adds the true riches. The true riches cannot be bought with money, and they're not money. God does give back. We appreciate your faithfulness during this time. The offerings have been good. We're able to stand behind our missionaries and keep supporting them. We're able to carry on the ministries of the church, and we do appreciate your faithfulness to God. Father, we are thankful again tonight. We have the opportunity of giving back to you a portion of us. That, that's the church. We know we're only managers, that everything we have belongs to you. And we know there's coming an accounting day, but you do bless. You said, given it shall be given, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And you promise to supply all our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Bless your people as we offer you these gifts out of hearts of love. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, we are in First Peter, okay? We're in First Peter. We started last week, and I'm calling this the Senior Apostle Talks to Us Today. Senior Apostle Talks to Us Today. And we got all the way through three and a half verses last week. <laughs> all the way through three and a half verses. So we're going slow. The Lord keeps pouring stuff into me. Now, you'd think my son kind of laughs at me after 60 years of in the ministry, I told them, I am having more of a battle over this Wednesday night than I would if I was preaching a big pastor's conference somewhere. The enemy battles me all day Tuesday and all day Wednesday. And I'm going through this, and I've taught, I've actually taught Peter in the college classroom as well as here before, but God keeps showing, this is what I want you to say, this is what I want you to do, this is where I want you to go. And the enemy tries to confuse me. Anybody else, the enemy try to confuse you? <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me, when you're studying the Word of God, and if I cough, it's my sinuses and my allergies. Okay, my temperature is only 97.6, okay, and I checked it today. <laughs> so, so I don't have corona, <laughs> but, but I do have allergies, and I am allergic to flowers. I know some of you ladies have floral perfume on because it's causing my nose to run already, <laughs> and uh, that's just the nature. Now, you can... You've seen what happens to me at funerals and weddings, but my nose just runs like a faucet, and the Lord hasn't seen fit to heal that. But I'm going to read the first four verses again, and just to remind you, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the, and actually the Greek text says, the elect scattered foreigners, the elect scattered foreigners. Now again, when you receive Jesus Christ, you become one of God's elect. God as I mentioned last week, God has chosen and elected those that are in Christ. Amen. We have the decision whether we're in Christ or not. That's why the Bible says, choose you this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So we are elect by God because we're in Jesus Christ. We are scattered as strangers. This world's not our home. It's just temporary. We're just passing through. Just think a million years from now, we won't even remember this place. We'll wonder what was that place we were at compared to this. And so we're elect scattered, and we're scattered all over the world as salt and light to let our light shine and to be the salt of the earth. So elect scattered strangers. I says scattered throughout Pontia, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Those are all Roman provinces. Elect, how the English Bible separates that verse. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God has foreknowledge, that's not predestination. Predestination means you have no choice. Oh, okay, and, and there are those that believe God actually predestines people before they're born. I'm going to send that person to hell. They have no choice about it. Well, twice in the New Testament it says God's not willing that one soul should perish. I want everyone to come to the knowledge of the truth. God hasn't predestined anyone to hell. He knows what we're going to do, but we make the choice. He, okay, he can see ahead of time. We can't see. All we can see is, oh, I remember yesterday, but all we can see is today. 
And then through sanctification of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit renders us holy when we receive Jesus Christ unto obedience. Oh, how'd that word get in there? How'd that word slip in there? Now, now he talks more about it later on in this chapter, so I'm just going to mention it here. A lot of times the New Testament writers in their introduction will basically cover everything they're going to talk about in that letter. And then you see them enlarge on it as it goes through, and, and he will enlarge on the word obedience greatly here in this, in this letter. Okay, because he had a tendency not to be, if you read his life story in the Gospels. Okay, obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. Now, let me turn back here to the book of Hebrews just for a second. I talked about the sprinkling of the blood of Christ, and I didn't do this last week, but I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 9. When Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, this is at Mount Sinai, when he got the law of God, according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats and water and scarlet and wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has enjoined with you. Moreover, he sprinkled blood upon the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry. Almost all things are... are, are it goes on to say, almost all things are by the law purged with the blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. And that's what he's referring to here, the sprinkling of the blood. The blood that cleanses us from sin, and the blood that keeps on cleansing us from sin. You know, First John says, if we're walking in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, keeps on cleansing us from all sin. Now, he doesn't say you can live any way you want to. He says if we're walking in the light. In other words, if you make up your mind to serve God and doing your best to serve him, <coughs> well, excuse me, I'm so glad that that blood keeps cleansing us. Are you with me? That blood keeps on cleansing us. He's writing to Christians when he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth isn't in us. And he says, I write these things that you don't sin. The Greek tense means don't commit a single sin. Don't you do it? Don't you do it? But if you do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he's a propitiation for our sin, and not for our sin only, but also the sin of the whole world. So that blood keeps on cleansing. If you're doing your best to live in the light and staying in touch with God, you're walking under the shower of the blood of Christ. It continually cleanses us. Now, you notice he says if we're walking in the light, meaning if we walk in the light, we still need the blood to cleanse us because God's not finished with us yet. Okay, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that... Whoops, I'm reading the wrong page here. <laughs> let, me, let me go back here. Okay. He says, sanctification of the Spirit and the obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ and to you grace and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again, meaning we've been born again, okay, into a living hope. Uh, well, why? The living hope of the resurrection is Jesus, because he's alive, all right? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. How many are glad you have an inheritance tonight? That's as far as we got last week. Okay, and he indicates our inheritance is guarded by an army. That's the meaning of the word. No one can break into the heavenly vault and steal your inheritance. Now, the government might break into your bank account and take it, okay, someday. As a matter of fact, that will happen someday. But, but after the church is gone, I, uh, and when the Antichrist comes on the scene and takes over the world, but some people will try to do it ahead of time. But uh, he, he says you have an inheritance that's guarded by an army, but then he says, for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. We are kept by the power of God. You make up your mind to serve God. There's no power in heaven or hell can take you out of God's hand. If you make up your mind, the only one that can take you out is you yourself. No one else can do it. Paul says, I know whom I believed, and I'm persuaded he's able to keep my deposit against that day. Okay, and let me read from the book of Jude. Uh, the, uh, in the book of Jude, that little one chapter book, that little one page book, the last five verses say this. He goes on to say, but you, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God, 
looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others with fear, pulling them out of the fire. <laughs> and that's even though you hate the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. He is able to keep us today. Can you say amen? You don't have to walk around, oops, I might slip off the tightrope and backslide. No, no, he, uh, he's able to keep us by his power as long as we are willing to be kept. And that's the big issue. Okay, that's the big issue. Okay, now let's get back to what he said. He, we are kept by the power of God by through faith. Now, I know there are those teaching, well, once you're saved, once you've been to an altar and received Jesus Christ, you're a child of God, and no matter what you do, no matter what you do, you're still saved, you're still going to heaven, uh, it's actually going to happen to you, okay? Uh, you're going to be preserved. Let, let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, this is a rather lengthy discussion here in 1 Corinthians. And this is one of those places where the chapter division is in the wrong place. I hate the chapter divisions in the Bible. That's why I tell you, when you read the Bible... Just read it. Ignore the chapter divisions and the verses. Just read it. And, and if a lot of people like to pull a verse out. Okay, I can't ignore the context. But the context here starts in verse 24 of chapter 9. Don't you know that they which run in a race all run, but one receives the prize, the gold medal we'd say today. And one receives the prize. Keep running so you may obtain Every man that strives for the gains, he's actually talking about the Olympic Games, is self-controlled in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. That was the laurel wreath in those days, but we an incorruptible crown. I, therefore, keep running, not as uncertainly so fight I, not as one that's just hitting the air, but I keep my body under and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I should be cast away. The Greek word is adokimos, and that's usually translated reprobate. This is the Apostle Paul talking about himself. And if you read this uh, preconceived theological theories, Paul is saying I can be disqualified for heaven if I don't keep you know, my body under control. Let's keep reading. Moreover, brothers, now he gives an illustration. I don't want you to be ignorant how our fathers, now he's talking about the Jews in the Old Testament. He says, how, he indicates how our fathers were under the cloud, that was the cloud that was with them by day and night, and passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all drank of the, and they all drank of the same spiritual drink for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now that's an analogy. And a lot of the Jewish rabbis believe the rock that Moses got the water on, I actually believe that rock followed them through the desert. I think it's more logical they made canals as they went along and the water followed them. But, 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 but he's using their analogy. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. They were overthrown in the desert. In other words, they started out for Canaan. They didn't make it. Now notice what he said. These things were, are our examples. Why, 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 Paul, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted? That's from number 11. We're sick and tired of the manna. Uh, how many of you have got sick and tired of the manna? How many of you know what the word mana, mana means? It means what is it, what is it? That's what they said the first day when they saw it. Mana, mana, they ate mana for 40 years, Okay. I mentioned before, my wife used to fix casseroles, put all the, left, all, all the leftover food when we weren't making much money, and we had two kids to feed at the time, and I'd sit down at the table and look at that casserole and say, mana, 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 what is it, what is it, but I ate it anyway, okay? And then he said, don't be idolaters as were some of them, as it's written, the people sat down to eat, drink, and rose up to play. That's from the book of Exodus chapter 32. 
Moses is up getting the Ten Commandments. God's writing them in the stone. And the people downstairs are, are worshiping a golden calf that Aaron made. They said, give us a God we can see. We don't know what's happened to this Moses. And so he made the golden calf. And when Moses got down, he was so angry. He says, the people rose up to play. In plain English, you were having a sexual time. That's the meaning of the word, okay, in plain English. And Moses on the way down saw the golden calf, and he had the tablets with the Ten Commandments in his hand. He's the only man in all of history who broke all Ten Commandments at once, smashed them on the ground. And he comes there and says, what have you done? He said, well, I threw the gold in the fire. Out came the calf. You know, read it for yourself. And, and that's after the Bible has already said he fashioned the calf. So he tried to make an excuse. And people sat down, rose up to play. And then the next one is, neither let us commit fornication as some of them also committed. Now, what's he talking about? Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 25, the first five verses. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Now, what does it mean? It goes on to say, they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods, and Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and the Lord said unto Moses, take the heads of all the people and hang them before the Lord against the sun, and the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, kill every one his men that's joined to Baal Peor. The women of Moab led them into idolatry. God said, I am going to eliminate Moab off the face of the earth. Now, I have heard preachers back 40 years ago, 50 years ago, in other parts of the country say, well, the Bible teaches racial segregation right there. Get rid of the Moabites. Don't have anything to do with the Moabites. Okay? Now, what did God say about the city of Jericho? He said, destroy it. Don't keep anyone alive out of Jericho. It's the accursed thing. And you read the family tree of Jesus in Matthew's gospel. There are five women mentioned. One, the Virgin Mary. None of the others are Israelites. Not one of the ancestresses of Jesus named in Matthew 1 are Israelites. He mentions Bathsheba, the daughter of Sheba. She that had been the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And he mentions Ruth the Moabitess. Even though Moabite was the accursed thing, Ruth had confidence in the God of Israel. And then what about Jericho? Rahab, the prostitute of Jericho, is mentioned as an ancestress of Jesus Christ, as is Tamar the Canaanitess. Well, it is God teaching spiritual segregation. Don't marry somebody that doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible teaches, spiritual segregation, not racial segregation. Racial segregation is an abomination. Can you say amen? Anything connected with it is. I better not get off on that. <laughs> okay, okay let, now, uh, let's go back. Whoops. Let's go back to, we'll go back to, first, we'll go back to first Corinthians now. Okay. Let me turn back here. I'm having to use a different Bible. My Bible has so many notes in it, I can't read the print. So I've got this other Bible that has nothing marked, so I, put, I got paper clips on there so I could. Uh, uh, that's why I've been working on this for two days, okay? So I don't have to look and look and look and look and look and look and look. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is where we are. Let me get back there. And that was verse 8. It goes on to say, neither let us commit fornication. Now, spiritual fornication is idolatry, okay? It's idolatry. That's what Amos calls it. And some of them that committed, they fell in one day, 23,000 Israelites. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted. This is from Numbers 21, and were destroyed of serpents. And then also in, in Numbers chapter 10, don't murmur as some of them murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all things happened unto them for examples. They are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age are come, Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. There is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to do it. A Christian can never say, the devil made me do it. A Christian can never say, I couldn't stop doing that. 
greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And he says, these are written for our admonition. Now, I have a lot of friends that say, well, you can't walk away from God. Then why are these warnings in the Bible if it can't happen? God doesn't waste his breath. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. The author, again, this is written to Jewish Christians that know the Old Testament. And by the way, Peter's written to those that knew the Old Testament well. He keeps referring to the Exodus and the events connected with it. Okay, Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we drift away from them. And the word is used of a boat drifting away from the dock. For if the word spoken by angels, that's the Sinai covenant, God gave to Moses through angels, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? Okay, we, us Christians, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Now over to chapter 3 of the book of Hebrews. Verse 1, wherefore, holy brothers, sharers of the heavenly calling. Okay, now can you call a non-Christian a brother or share of the heavenly calling? No, only Christians, all right? Holy brothers, sharers of the heavenly calling. Then in verse 7, he starts saying this. Wherefore, the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as in the provocation and the day of transgression in the desert where your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works for 40 years. I was disgusted with that generation and said they do always wander away in their heart and they have forgotten my ways. I swear in my wrath they will not enter into my rest. In other words, they're not going to make it into the promised land. Take heed, therefore, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and apostatizing from the living God. An apostate no longer believes Jesus is the way of salvation. I have met some. I have met some that once they know the Lord, and today they deny that he's even the way to God. But exhort one another while it's called today, lest any of you be hard through the deceitfulness of sin. That's two warnings just right here. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened. And the text means that you come to a point of becoming enlightened. Secondly, have tasted of the heavenly gift. That's Jesus. Thirdly, were made sharers of the Holy Spirit. That happens when you're saved. Okay, and have tasted the word of God. Good. And have tasted the powers of the world to come. Good. And fell away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they keep on crucifying the Son of God afresh and keep on putting him to an open shame. Why is this warning in the Bible if it can't happen? Okay, it's there because the enemy is always trying to destroy. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, starting with verse 26. Now let me say before I read, all sin is willful. It's not like you're walking along, whoops, I fell into a sin. It's an exercise of our will to sin. The body only sins after the mind sins, after I decide to do that, okay? So he says if we keep practicing willful sin, it's a habitual thing he's talking about. It's a continuous action verb. I'm just going to keep doing this every Tuesday whether God likes it or not. I'm just going to keep going here whether or whether God likes it. I'm just going to keep having these friends whether God likes it or not. I'm just going to keep, well, I'm just going to keep it up whether God likes it or not, okay? Now, for if we keep on practicing willful sin after we've received the knowledge of the truth. Now, this word is not the general word for knowledge. Okay, I've given you these words before. Say gnosis. Okay, it's spelled G-N-O-S-I-S. We get our word Gnostic from that. Okay, that means to know. Two plus two is four. That's gnosis. But this word is epinosis. Say epinosis. This is personal experimental knowledge. You've experienced God. In the New Testament, there is no such thing as false epinosis. It means you really know God. Not one translation makes a distinction between gnosis and epinosis. Not one translation I know of. And there's a very strong distinction between them in the New Testament. Okay, epinosis. After we've received the epinosis of the truth, there remains no longer a sacrifice for our sins. 
There's no longer a sacrifice, no more cleansing of the blood, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation shall devour the adversary. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. If I'm a sore punishment, suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who has trodden underfoot the Son of God, has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and done despite to the Spirit of grace. We know him that said, Vengeance belongs unto me, I will recompense, says the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It's a fearful thing to the fall into the hands of the living God. Why is the warning there if it can't happen? Now, again, the emphasis in the Bible is God's able to keep you. But again, you have to be willing to be kept. You have to be willing to be kept all the way through. Okay, now let's look at 2 Peter. Okay, I'm going to read one verse ahead of time in 2 Peter. Uh, it's, actually, it's actually chapter 2, beginning with the, with the middle of the 19th verse. Well, well, I'm going to start at the beginning of the 19th verse. He's talking about false prophets, first of all. While they promise you liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. For of what a man is overcome of, the same he is brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the epinosis here, uh, okay, the personal experimental knowledge of the Lord, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse than the beginning. It is better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered them. It's happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again and the saw that was washed to his wallowing in the mire. Now he gives these warnings because they can happen, but how many know he's able to keep you? Say amen. That's the main emphasis. That's the main emphasis. But this idea that you can get saved and live any way you want that's popular, it's not true. It's simply not true. I was actually speaking to a friend and I mentioned these verses. He said, well, they weren't saved in the first place. I said, well, how can God call them holy brothers, shares of the heavenly calling? And he always says, we and us. The author is thereby included. Of course, many of you know when I read the book of Hebrews, I think it was written by a woman, so I should say she. Okay. Now, so uh, he, he gives us that warning. And then now he went on to say... Uh, let's get back to 1 Peter, verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, in the New Testament, there are five different tenses for the word saved. Five different tenses. Now, Greek has a lot of tenses, more than English, okay? Uh, there's a simple past tense. January 28, 1951, I was saved. Okay, it's bad English. How many remember when you was saved? Okay, you were saved, okay? Okay, well, at a point in time, I was saved. Secondly, there's the present tense, I am saved. How many can say I am saved? Okay, because of God's grace and the Holy Spirit bearing witness. But there is also a continuous action present tense, I am being saved. In other words, God's not finished with me yet. It's still a process that I'm going through. So I am being saved 24 hours a day. And it said it will be complete unto salvation when we stand in the presence of God. I am being saved, okay? And then there's a future tense. We will be saved when the rapture of the church takes place. And when we, <coughs> excuse me, when we stand in the presence of God. But in, and then in Greek, we have a perfect tense. And that's a present condition as a result of a previous action. Now, the best example of that is Ephesians chapter 2, where it says, by, our English Bible says, by grace you are saved through faith. The Greek text says, by faith you are having been saved through faith. But you translate it, I am saved. Why? Because of what happened previously, you are now saved. And if I say I'm standing here tonight, I am here. What tense is that in English? Present, present tense. But if I think I've been studying for two days at the dining room table, I live in a condo, so I don't have a lot of tables. Okay, at the dining room table, and I got in my car, and I, I, and I worked hard, and I drove over here, and I came into church, and, as a, and I put on the microphone, and as a result of all that, I am here. That's a Greek present tense, and that's a Greek perfect tense. You are saved because of what's happened in the past. You met Jesus Christ, and he changed your life. When Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, tetelestai, it's a Greek perfect tense. 
meaning that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, where God said the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent, all the way through the prophecies of the Old Testament, the 333 that Jesus fulfilled, the bearing of man's sin on the cross of Calvary, when Jesus said, it is finished, all that is done, it's over, it's through, and God ripped the veil of the temple in two to prove it. We now have access into the presence of God. So it's all done. It's all through. It's all over. So we are saved. We have been saved. We are being saved. We will be saved, okay, in, a, in all those different tenses. Now, this next verse isn't too popular. That, that verse is, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Wherein you greatly rejoice, but now for a season you are in heaviness, if need be, through multicolored testings, that the testing of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes or be tried with fire, might be prayed, we might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing. That's the word revelation there, apocalypse, that we get our word revelation from, okay? It's the appearing of Jesus Christ. That's Revelation 19 when he comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we come back with him, okay? But the testing of your faith. God, what, what, what do you mean by testing? I watch television, and I know if you got faith, you're never going to have any trouble. Just listen to these evangelists. And beside that, you can be rich. Yeah, how many are all for that? <laughs> how many found out it doesn't work that way? I remind them that the Bible in James says the poor are rich in faith. Oh, I wonder about that. Okay. Poor or rich in faith. As I've said, God doesn't have one gospel for Togo, West Africa, and another gospel for America. He has one gospel for fourth world countries and third world countries and first world countries. But let's read, uh, let's go to James, first of all, chapter 1. James chapter, this is stuff the Lord's been just pounding me with for two days. As a Christian, you're going to go through some difficult times. So many are having a hard time with this right now. I mean, but, but also, are you aware that a lot of Christians are being killed around the world every day? The American media won't report it. You know, they won't tell you. Uh, 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 we had one of our Assembly of God pastors murdered in, uh, in Burkina Faso just two weeks ago. Why? Because he refused to become a Muslim. And, and Burkina Faso used to be a Christian nation. As a matter of fact, I got to preach there a number of years ago. It's in French West Africa. James, the servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered. There's the word scattered again, okay, all over. My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various testings. Now, the King James says temptation. No, the context shows it's testing. It's the Greek word peirazo that can either be tempted or, or can also mean testing, and the context determines the meaning of the word. Here he's talking about testing. Later on in the chapter, he uses it for temptation to sin. Knowing this, that the testing of your faith works endurance. Let endurance have its complete work, that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. And then he says about when you're going through the test, if any of you lack wisdom, ask of God that gives to all men liberally, and he's not going to rebuke you, and it shall be given him. But ask in faith. Don't wave like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. No, but ask in faith. Believe God, he will show you what he's trying to teach you but you're going to go through a difficult time. And just to remind you, I want to remind you what Peter's going to say in his fourth chapter of the book we're looking at. Beloved, stop thinking it's strange concerning the fiery trial that's trying you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice, inasmuch as you're a share of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you'll be glad with exceeding great joy. Now, certainly, people like the Apostle Paul would never have a difficult time. They were so spiritual. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, they were so spiritual. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians, okay? Let's go over to 1 Corinthians. Lost my verse here. Uh, let me see. 
I can quote it, but I don't want to quote it. I want to read it because I might. I'm not used to this Bible. My other one, I can't. I can't even turn the pages, and then I can't read it when I do. So. Uh. Oh, I wanted to go to John chapter 15. I knew I'd forgotten something. John chapter 15, how can it be eternal life if we can walk away from it? I mean, if I've got eternal life today, how can I possibly walk away from it and actually claim that what I have is eternal life? How can I do that? John chapter 15, that's where I wanted to go. Okay, I actually jumped ahead of myself. John chapter 15. Well, what is eternal life? I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that's not bearing fruit, he takes away. Every branch in me that's bearing fruit, he prunes it. Ooh, that hurts. That it may bring forth more fruit. Now, you're clinging to the word that I've spoken unto you. Keep remaining in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it keep remaining in the vine, no more can you unless you keep remaining in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that remains in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man does not keep remaining in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. What is eternal life? The vine. We're just the branches. It is eternal life as long as you're abiding in Jesus. He's the one that gives us eternal life. It's not something that we own individually. Okay, as long as we're connected with him, we have that eternal life. We're, yeah, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody, nobody, nobody comes to the Father but by me. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is what I wanted. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I stuck all these paper clips in so I would have the verses. I'm going to read at length here. Okay, now here's the Apostle Paul, the easy, easy, easy time, the easy time he had serving God. I get the, I guess I shouldn't use these paper clips. <laughs> that, that, that's something new I'm doing, yeah. No, that wouldn't work for me either. Okay, now, we have this treasure in crockpots. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know King James says earthen vessels. That's a crock pot. We have this treasure in crock pots that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're knocked down, but not knocked out. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in us. He's talking about these difficulties, which he calls later on in this chapter, a light affliction. Now look at 2 Corinthians 11. His credentials for being an apostle. You know, I turn on the TV, and this man's saying, well, what proves I'm a man of God? I've got two big mansions, and I've got a yacht, and I have an airplane, and that proves I'm spiritual. Well, let's hear what Paul's credentials are. Here, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. Of the Jews, five times received our 40 stripes except one, so 39 stripes. Three times I was beaten with canes. Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I, I bobbed up and down in the Mediterranean like a cork. I know that's not the King James Version. <laughs> in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the desert, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brothers, in weariness and painfulness, in watching often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness. And beside these things that are without, there comes upon me daily the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I am not burned? If I must glory, I will glory in the things which mount my infirmities. 
Now that's his credentials for being a man of God. That's his credentials. We don't like tribulation. I, don't, I know none of you are going to wake up tomorrow morning and say, God put me through a test. No, no, no. No, no. That's not our, that's not our desire. That's not our goal. Okay, look at Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Romans chapter 5. Yeah, yeah, Lord, get me out of here. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, let us keep having peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have, we, we have access by this faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but let us glory in tribulation. Ooh, why'd you put that in there, Rob? <laughs> also, knowing that tribulation works endurance, and endurance works experience, and experience works hope. And again, hope in the Bible is not wishful thinking. Something's going to happen, we just don't see it yet. And hope makes not a shame. Why? Because the love of God is shared, brought in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Okay? the Holy Spirit who is given to us. And so uh, you go through those kind of difficulties, those kind of circumstances, those things you don't understand, but God has a purpose. God has a purpose. Let me turn over now to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We go through these difficult times and we thought, God, what? Why, where did, what did I do wrong? How, how do I deserve this? Okay, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Have you forgotten the exhortation that speaks unto you as children? My son, don't despise the child training of the Lord. How many of you got child trained by your fathers? Oh, yes. And you hear Pastor George, you know, he got child trained, although, although his sisters say he kind of overdoes that a bit. <laughs> but, but, but he had three older sisters, too. Okay. And don't despise the child training of the Lord and are faint when you're rebuked of him. God says, no, I'm not going to do this. For whom the Lord loves, he child trains and spanks every son whom he receives. If you endure child Okay, if you endure child training, God deals with you as with sons. What son is he whom the father does not child train? Now, you ladies are sons, too. The word son means legal heir in the New Testament. You're also called children, which means we're sharers of his nature. So, so we're all both children and sons, legal heirs that have reached the age of making decisions. But if you be without child training, we're of all sharers, then you're illegitimate and not sons. Moreover, have we had fathers after our flesh who corrected us and we gave them respect? How much more shall we rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they for a few years chastened us according to what they thought was best, but he for our profit that we might be a sharer of his holiness. That's what he's working out. Now, no child training for the present seems to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it brings forth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are continuously exercised thereby. And have you ever looked up and said, God, when are you going to get finished with me? When are you going to quit? Isn't it about time? I've been at this for quite a while. Isn't it about time? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. What is he child training us to be? Okay, Ephesians chapter 4. This is, the, this is the direction of our child training. I hate clocks. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, it mentions that he led a train of vanquished foes and he gives them back to the church as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints into the work of the ministry. And then it says in verse 13, until we all come in the unity of the faith into the epinosis, okay, of the Son of God, personal experimental knowledge of the Son of God, unto a full-grown man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What's a measure of a stature? It's fancy words for a mark on the wall. 
And the best illustration I've got, when I was a little boy growing up in Detroit, my mother would back me up against the wall on my birthday and draw a line. Georgie, seven years old. Georgie, eight years old. Georgie, nine years old. And I'd wait till my dad, Big George, got home from work, and I'd back him up against the wall, and I'd look at his mark, and I'd look at my mark. He was six foot. I think someday I'm going to make it. Well, I made five foot, 11 and a half. But I had a long way to go. We have a mark on the wall. It's the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Totally, totally to full, the fullness, the fullness. The Greek word is pleroma. Uh, if a balloon is full and you go, it's going to burst. That's pleroma, so full. Can't have anything else, okay? Now, measure the stature of Christ that we henceforth be told more children, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of teaching. You know, if a little boy comes home and tells his sister, I heard a doggy say hello to a kitty cat, that's fine. However, if a 20-year-old man comes home and said, I hear a dog say hello to a kitty cat, you better pray for him. Okay, the measure of the stature, the difference between a man and a boy. A boy will believe what he's told. A man will examine the facts, okay, and check them out. And notice, by the slight of men, and it actually says crooked dice-throwing men. False teaching comes from crooked dice throwers. Now, what's the difference between a crooked dice and a regular dice? What do you know about a crooked dice? You know what they're going to come before you throw the dice. You know what the conclusion is going to be. That's what false teaching does. It starts with a conclusion and goes and pulls Scripture totally out of context to prove it. That's where cults come from. Totally out of context. The Bible means what it means in that sentence, in that paragraph, in that context. And people pull it out and make it say what it doesn't say. That's how cults arise. The man that started Jehovah's Witnesses, Taz Russell, decided what he wanted to believe, then pulled a whole bunch of scriptures out of context to prove them. That's why they study their scripture studies instead of the scripture. Okay, they say, open your Bible, read this chapter, then close it and don't read anymore. And so... But, but that's what they do. That's what they do. The unit of faith is measure the stature of crook. No more children. A line wait to speak in the truth and love may grow up into him in all things which is ahead, even Christ. So if you're going through a hard time, it's because God loves you. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Okay. But, but, but he's testing us to produce gold. Uh, let's look at Malachi. Okay, Malachi chapter 3. I'm skipping some of the things I had down because of the monster time up there. But let's go to the book of Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 says this. He's talking about the... He's actually talking about John the Baptist and then Jesus, okay? He said, Behold, I'll send my messenger. He shall prepare the way before me. That'd be Jesus speaking. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his, at his own temple. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. He's talking about Jesus here. Who shall abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Now, he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold. Uh, he will purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering of righteousness. He will, he will sit as a refiner of silver. Now, years ago, they had an article in the Kansas City Star by a refiner of silver. And they asked him, how do you refine silver? He said, number one, I get the fire as hot as I can get it. And they said, well, how do you know when it's refined? He said, when I can see my image in it. Isn't that exactly what God's doing us? He's refining till he can see the image of Christ in us. By our nature, how's that defined? The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. So he's refining us, okay? He's refining us to make, to make us into that image. And uh, uh, he's actually accomplishing that. All right, let's get back to 1 Peter now and see what he says. 1 <laughs> Peter. You're in heaviness through multicolored testings. That the testing of your faith be much more precious than gold that perishes or be tried with fire, but be found in the praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. I've never seen him, have you? Now, I've seen visions, but I've never seen him. I only, 
I've only ever had one vision, but uh, but we haven't seen him, but you love him. Okay, you love him. Believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable, indescribable is a good translation. You can't talk about it. What about the joy of the Lord? Uh, I was... I was actually thinking earlier about a verse of scripture in Isaiah. Uh, It's in Isaiah 61. Let me read it for you here. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. He has clothed me with the garment of salvation. Okay? He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. He's done the whole thing. I, I, he's covered me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, as a bride adorns adorn herself with jewels. A robe of righteousness, okay, a garment of salvation, free gift of God. I like in, Ze- in Zechariah chapter 3, it shows me Joshua the high priest representing the people of Israel clothed with filthy garments. And God says, take away the filthy garment and give him a change of raiment and say, I've caused your iniquity to pass from you. Cause your iniquity to pass. And we read in the book of Revelation that that the white raiment is the righteousness of the saints. The righteousness of the saints. So uh, it actually produces joy. Joy. And again, that's part of the fruit of the Spirit. First one's love, what's the second one? Joy. Now, does that mean you're always, (laughs) no, no. Because you can be in heaviness through multicolored testing. It's not always hilarity. What is joy? What is joy? It's that confidence no matter what you're going through, God is going to give you the victory. He will fight what? For you. He will fight with you. What he will do? Give you the victory. Oh, by the way, I wanted to ask at the beginning of tonight, what did I say was the best witness of the resurrection? Say, I am. You're the best witness of the resurrection in this day. Okay, people say, well, Peter saw him. Well, that was 2,000 years ago. Okay, they need people who have met him today. Alan, you talk loud. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, right. Absolutely. And we'll see that in chapter, I will see that in Second Peter too. Uh, 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 okay, now let me get back to First Peter here. I'm using an unfamiliar Bible. (coughs) Excuse me. First Peter. I've got to get back to the verse. Whom whom having not seen, you loved, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. That's the goal. The soul is the real you. Okay, we live in a tent called the body. We have a spirit. The spirit, we communicate with spiritual beings. That's why the enemy, being a spirit, can put thoughts into your mind. You're never going to get to the place where he can't put thoughts into your mind. Okay, we'll be talking about that a little bit later when he talks about uh, later on the 11th verse. But the end is the salvation of our soul, the real you, the real you. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired. Now, I love this verse here. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come to you. Searching what? When? What am I talking about? When's it going to happen? I heard one television preacher say they knew exactly what they were saying. That's not what this says. What? What am I talking about, Lord? When's that going to happen? Now, they knew they were talking about the coming Messiah sometimes, but most of what they wrote, they're writing, and all of a sudden, God gives them, what, 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 what? Well, when's it going to happen, God? What, 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 what? Have you ever had God do, God do that to you? I have. I have. Why do you want me to say that? How many remember my Humpty Dumpty story? Okay, how many don't remember? How many have never heard my Humpty Dumpty story? Okay, well, I guess everybody has, so I won't have to use it. Good. <laughs> okay. And... Uh, it's like C.M. Ward. I've mentioned C.M. Ward preaching on the ABC network. He was on more stations around the world than Billy Graham. And he's preaching. And since he was on ABC here in the United States, he had to have word for word he was going to say. And right in the middle of his sermon, he said, don't jump. Don't jump. The answer's in your briefcase. Don't jump. Went on to preaching. 
And the engineer asked him, he said, why'd you say that? He said, I don't know. I said, what does it mean? He said, I don't know. Six months later, he gets a letter from a serviceman in Germany who had decided to commit suicide jumping off a high-speed train. And he said he wanted to hear a gospel sermon and he wanted to read part of the Bible before he jumped off. He had his briefcase, he had a tape recorder. Someone had given him one of C.M. Ward's tapes and he also had his Bible. He took the tape recorder and the tape out. The only thing in his briefcase was his Bible. He put the tape in, hit the button, and guess what it said first? Don't jump. The answer's in your briefcase. And six months later, that happened. God knows the end from the beginning. I don't... <coughs> and I'm sure this has happened to everyone that's ever preached the gospel. Someone on the way out of service after would say, Pastor, who told you about me? Because God give, gave me something to say that I had not planned on saying. And that happened time after time after time after time. You know that, yeah. It's, it's like Elizabeth Devon, before she was back in the congregation in her 20s. And I, I don't know if you know her testimony or not. You know, they have the greatest prison ministry in America right now, hold revivals in the biggest prisons. Right now, they got nothing to do because the prisons are all locked, under lockdown. But, but uh, she was on drugs and alcohol. Uh, she, she had been kidnapped and raped when she was a teenager on the way home from school. The man said he was going to throw her body in the Missouri River. And she, she actually told me I could share this or I wouldn't do it. And I've used it all over the world. And she, she, she thought, well, no one will ever want me. It's an unfortunate thing that happens to people. And she was on drugs and alcohol in her 20s. She got home one Sunday, one Saturday night. She woke up Sunday morning, didn't have the foggiest idea how she got home. And she said, a strong male voice said, I brought you home last night, go to church. She was driving around, stopped out here. She came in church, and she was getting ready to walk out. And she actually said, I said this to myself, God couldn't care about a nasty little girl like me. And God spoke to me while I was giving the altar call. I said, there's somebody here saying God couldn't care about a nasty person like me. And Mary Jo walked all the way across the auditorium, took her by the hand, and said, it's you. And she met Jesus Christ that day. And I had the privilege of marrying she and Randy. And they have that great ministry today, and we help support them. And God changes people. But I didn't know why I was saying that. But that's what happens. And, and that's when you go from preaching into prophesying. God gives you something to say you don't know. You don't anticipate. You don't, it always happens. It always happens. I've said things up here tonight I had no intention of saying. But God keeps saying, this, this is what I want. Now, we're going to go on from here. We're not going to talk about the fact that you can walk away anymore. We've already talked about that. God's able to keep us. That's the main thought. If you want to be kept, God will keep you. If you want to be kept. It doesn't mean he's finished with you yet. Paul, they put us, Paul said from the Roman prison, I have not yet apprehended that for which I was apprehended of Christ. But this one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind, stretching the things that are before, I press toward the mark for the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. And if you want to be perfect, be like-minded. I'm not finished with you yet either. He's still working on us. You know, you talk about the joy of the Lord. I mentioned this in a sermon a couple of years ago. I actually got a three-and-a-half-page letter from some guy in ministry, and he said 16 times in three-and-a-half pages, be joyful. Stop being anxious about anything. Uh, he probably hasn't pastored in the hood for 47 years. Uh, be joyful. But who wrote that? That's the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians. 16 times in three chapters, three and a half chapters, three and a half pages, be joyful. Where is he writing from? Death row. He's about to have his head cut off from Nero. What does he say? For your sakes, I'd rather stay here, but for me, I'm ready to take down this tent and depart and be with Christ. That's much rather better. But 16 times from the prison cell. And we haven't been there. We haven't been on death row. And so in the middle of the storms of life, he gives us that joy to somehow get through. A day at a time. Sometimes an hour at a time. I was asked on the question and answer program last night. It's on Facebook from 7.30 to 9 on Tuesday nights. And I was asked, what's the most difficult situation you've ever had to face with a member of your church? 
And I thought back, and that's when we had a fire at Christmas time where a Christmas tree caught fire and actually killed one of our sister's daughters and her three grandchildren. We had four caskets. The media showed up for that funeral. I think that's the most difficult time I've ever been through, to watch that happen, to be with them, and yet to see how God brought us through, brought her through, the mother, how he brought her through. And I remember a remark, a remark the Lord gave me. She said she was going to join our choir because she wanted to sing to the Lord. And I just mentioned that day she's singing in a better choir than ours. But we go through times like that. And I tried to tell them sometimes all you can do is hold people's hands and cry with them and let them know that you care. We don't have easy answers. We don't have easy answers. If you've been to one of my funerals, I always mention the first funeral I ever had. I was pastoring at Fristow, Missouri, a congregation of 54 people, population of the town 100. I was only 23 years old. And I thought, boy, I'm going to go over there and I'm going to pray such a prayer they're not going to know what hit them. I got back to that little stone parsonage that still sits on Old Highway 65, and I told Gene, I don't belong in the ministry. I don't have any words that can take the place of a loved one. I don't have any prayer that can bring peace. That's not my job. That's his job. Amen. That's why I've told pastors around the world, sometimes all you can do is hold people's hands and cry with them and let them know that you really care and you're there for whatever they need. That's all we can do, any of us. But we can be there for people. We can pray and ask God to be with them and strengthen them. Father, we're thankful again tonight for your love and your amazing grace that you have forgiven our sins, that we have the power of the Holy Spirit within that you've called us to obedience, to hear your voice, to walk as you want us to walk. And then you give us the power when we make up our mind to do it. It's not by our power. We can't do it. But you put your Holy Spirit within to enable us to do and live as you want us to live. So we depend on your power, not our own ability. We can't change our lives. You do the changing. But help us to hear your voice saying, this is the way, walk in it. As every head is bowed and every eye closed, I always ask, even though I think I know everybody here, is there anyone here tonight you say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. I need Jesus Christ in my life. Pray for me. Just slip your hand up and down. Not asking you to join this church. We're not the way to heaven. God bless you. Jesus Christ is the only way. It's the only way. Okay, I'm going to ask the whole congregation to pray this prayer. Okay? The whole congregation... And you pray this prayer with the whole congregation, and God will meet you right now. Okay, let's pray this prayer. Dear Father, I know I've sinned. I've gone my own way. I don't want to live that way anymore. Father, forgive my sins in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be Lord of my life. I give you my life. I give you everything I am and everything I hope to be. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you're watching on, if you're watching on, the, if you're watching on the web, prayed that prayer with us. I've, I've actually led people in that prayer at funerals and seen lives changed. And he will change your life a day at a time and a moment at a time. And I want you all to repeat this. God loves me as if I'm the only one he ever had to love. I'm as important to God as any person who has ever lived. And if I'd have been the only one that sinned, Jesus would have died just for me. How many believe that tonight? Praise God. That's the truth. That's the truth of the gospel. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. And I know it's hard with just a few of us here. But God bless. Let me remind you, we have room for you on Sunday and plenty of spacing. Plenty of spacing, so let me encourage you, 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock Sunday morning. God bless you. Again, thank you for being here. <laughs>